So this appears to be the perfect opportunity to create this video as I've been using a new camera now for the past few weeks, uh, the Fuji GFX 100S. And I do want to preface this real quick by saying that the information contained in this video is not specifically specifically related only to this camera as I set up pretty much every camera the same way for landscape photography, regardless of which camera or camera brand I happen to be using. And I think everyone sets up their camera with a different approach based off of what they shoot and, and how they shoot it. So a wildlife or a portrait photographer is probably going to set up their camera in a completely different manner than I do. But over the years, the, the way I set up mine has evolved as the way I operate when I'm on location has changed as well. But the following 10 or maybe it's 15 items. I think it's closer to 15. The following 15 items are what I changed when setting up this new camera and are generally the main foundation, so to speak, from a, I guess, a settings perspective that I typically will dial in when setting up a new camera for landscape photography. Now, these are kind of, I guess, my, my must change settings, I suppose. These are the same 15, it's either 15 or 16, or maybe 17, um, regardless however many it is, but these are the things that I always change. So as soon as I get a camera out of a box, this is usually the things that I go ahead and start to set up. This works well for, for my, uh, my workflow for landscape photography. So to jump right into it, the very first thing that I turn on is the, uh, the self timer. I don't use a remote shutter, but uh, what I always like to do is come over to the, the menu section and wherever self timer happens to be in your camera, mine offers a two or a 10 second self timer. And regardless of what kind of camera you're using, it, you can maybe, maybe a two second or maybe a five second or 10 second self timer, but whatever it is, I would highly recommend turning that on. And if I'm using a long lens, a physically long lens, I'll usually change this to a 10 second self timer just to give the camera a little bit of additional time to settle after I press the, uh, the shutter button to uh, go ahead and engage that exposure. But self timer is absolutely critical because I'm almost always shooting on a tripod. Now, the second thing that I always turn off is, and this is a big one for me, it's uh, actually, let me turn my self timer on because I had it off for this video. T two second, which is usually what I operate on. But the next thing is this, these beeps, all of the beeps, especially this beep right here. I think the self timer beep is the worst one of them all. So I turn off all beeps on the camera and uh, the way that I will go ahead and do it with this camera is just come down to the actual settings section down here, the wrench, sound setup, and I will turn the autofocus beep and I will take this to off. And then the self timer beep, which I find to be the most annoying of the bunch, I will set that to off as well. So any type of beeping noise, I'd like to go ahead and turn all of those off, not because I'm trying to be ninja-like or a stealth uh, photographer or anything like that, but you know, you're in the great outdoors, you're photographing um, nature. Usually the things you're hearing is running water or chirping birds, and then you have these loud, just like beep, beep, beep noises, and it just, it just doesn't um, seem to fit the atmosphere. Now, the next thing that I always turn off is long exposure noise reduction. And it seems that most cameras have this. And it also seems that usually when cameras are shipped to you, that this the long exposure noise reduction is turned on. And I always like to turn that off because mainly, let me get back to my menu, mainly because I like to have control of how I reduce noise in my images. So if I want to reduce it in Photoshop or if I want to do it inside of... Uh, set this to off right there. But I wanna have the control. If I wanna reduce noise in Capture One, Photoshop, Lightroom, I wanna be able to do that in my post-processing workflow. I don't want the camera to try and reduce any kind of noise because who knows what type of uh, algorithm or how good of a job it actually does. So I always leave that off and I handle that myself whenever I go to edit my photographs. Now, the next thing that I always do is back button focusing. I always enable that. Made a video on this not too long ago about why I back button focus. But as you can tell here, when I half press the shutter button, it is not locking in on uh, anything. But when I change, when I select this button right here, which is where I have the focusing set to now, you'll notice that it, go, it locks on focus there. You no longer hear those beeps because I turned that off. And I can also do a touch screen focus as well. But I like a big fan of back button focus and I set that up on every single one of my cameras. Now, the next thing is uh, bracketing. I do, um, I would say, I err on the side of caution from saying I do a lot of bracketing, but it is a function that I use quite often, and I think it's a pretty common 
um, shooting style in outdoor photography because it's not uncommon to to encounter situations that have a great dynamic range. So uh, bright highlights and dark shadows and bracketing come, can come in uh, very handy. So what I do is I always set it to one of the custom modes. I have it on C1 right here. So I can easily just make one quick switch and I'm automatically in the bracketing mode. And you can see it right here as I rotate my shutter speed, how that bracket changes. And I have mine set up for a three shot bracket, two shots or two stops above my base exposure and two stops below my base exposure. But it's nice just to be able to quickly flip into a bracketing mode without having to jump into any type of uh, menus or anything like that. Now the next thing is, and this is a big thing, is uh, the focusing mode. So I always use a single point of focus, but what's interesting is I don't actually set it to a single point of focus in the camera. And I'll show you what I mean right here. So if I lock on focus right here, let's say press in, and I rotate this dial here, I can change between the different sizes of that single focus point, which is very handy. But what I like to do is I will jump into the menus and then come down here to AF mode. And I actually set this to all. And the reason I set it to all is this, because if I punch in again and I rotate this wheel, now I have the ability to go to single point of focus and I have the different sizes of single point of focus. I can also go zone, I can also go um, wide. I have basically all potential options right at my fingertips. Now, most of the time, I'm almost always in the single point of, fo single point of focus, but it's nice to be able to, to quickly be able to have the option to change between the other various focus modes as well. Now, another thing is the autofocus plus manual focus mode. I always set that to on. And the reason I do that is because of this. So let's say I, I lock focus right here. And let's say I want to refine it by manual focusing. You'll see that nothing is happening. And the reason I do that, and I, and I made a video on this not too long ago as well, about a lot of times when I focus, I will use the autofocusing engine inside the camera. I think cameras today are, are absolutely fantastic when it comes to autofocus. So I always lean on that first to get me in the ballpark. And then I like to refine that autofocus by using the manual focus, just to tighten it up a little bit, make sure it's completely, perfectly pin sharp. But if you don't have autofocus and manual focus enabled, you can't do that. You can't bounce from one to other. So I'll go into the manual mode, go down to AF plus MF, and then I like to set this to on. And now watch what happens. So if I lock focus there and I rotate the manual focus ring, you'll notice that you can see it right down here that I am now in manual focus as well. So I can easily go ahead and refine my focus from there. And then the next thing I'll turn on is something called focus check, which takes this a step further. So if I go into the manual mode again, I should say into the menu mode, go to uh, focus check and turn that to on. This is really cool. Check out what happens now. So lock focus on the lava lamp and then I rotate the manual focus ring. And not only am I in manual focus, but I'm also zoomed in in order to help me refine that focus even further. So I think that is incredibly handy. So I always enable that as well. And then as far as um, like focus peaking, I always set that to one, I always make sure it's enabled, but I will also set that to manual focus assist, assist peak, focus peak highlight. And I always put it on red, the brightest value possible. It's just easier for my eyes to see, but I think this camera comes in red, white, yellow. Those are the different focus peaking colors you can pick and maybe your camera has a little bit different, but most cameras do, I believe, have focus peaking and um, I'm not sure whether or not you can select certain colors like you can with this camera, but I always set it to, uh, to yellow. And then as far as things like the, the auto white, or I should say white balance, I always shoot with uh, auto white balance right here. And um, I just let the, I always shoot in raw, so I always kind of let the camera just decide what the white balance will be. Unless I am shooting video, then I always select sunny white balance because the last thing you want when you're filming video is to have the white balance changing on every single scene. That's a disaster in post-processing. But when it comes to shooting raw photographs, I just leave it on auto white balance. And in a metering mode, I always leave it on multi. I really don't fuss around with that too much. I don't change it a whole lot. I always leave it on multi or average uh, of average metering, metering mode. That was a mouthful. And then as far as like picture profiles go, I, I think every camera comes with a standard profile. And some cameras come with like things like vivid profile or flat profile. I always just use the, uh, the standard um, profile here. I don't really, I guess I sometimes I play around with these different film simulations and they are pretty cool if you're shooting JPEGs, 
But when I'm shooting raw, I will almost always just leave this on a standard picture profile. And that leads me to my next point. I always do shoot in raw. And uh, I would highly encourage anybody to do the same as well. If I can actually get to that section up here. So image quality, raw, right there. So I just pretty much leave it there. So every once in a while, maybe I'll shoot raw plus JPEG, but I am always shooting in raw. And I'm also always shooting in manual mode as well. So it just kind of lives right there in manual mode. And then the last two things are, you know, I always want to be able to have easy access to a histogram. So for this camera, I have it assigned to the swipe up feature so I can easily see that. I can also easily see it right here on this little top screen on this camera, which I think is incredibly handy. But being able to quickly access a histogram, I think is very important. And then the final thing is that, in, what is the final thing? Oh, image stabilization or, or IBIS, in-body image stabilization. Most cameras today have it. And I'd like to, and I, I don't know what it is, but it seems like the, the IBIS settings are always buried deep into menus. But I always like to assign it to an actual button. I have it assigned right here. And as you can see, IS mode continuous or IS mode shooting only or IS mode off. Since I'm almost always on a tripod, I leave the image IBIS in-body image stabilization set to off. But if I want to capture something quickly handheld, I want to be able to easily switch that on and take advantage of the, uh, the image stabilization. So I always assign that to a separate button as well. But those are the, I'm not even sure how many that, that was, 15 or 17 items that I will always change whenever I'm setting up a new camera or an old camera. And there are some other things that I make um, tweaks here and there just to experiment with to see if I like it. But those are always kind of the, the foundational things that I always set up and it works really good for, uh, for my style of landscape photography. So I do hope that that information was helpful. If you were struggling or wanted some, uh, maybe some just different ideas on how you could possibly set up your camera for, uh, for outdoor photography, I hope that there was uh, at least one nugget of information that you could uh, take away from this video that will help you out in setting up your camera. As always, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments section below and I'll do my best to get back to you as soon as possible. And as always, I really, really do appreciate you watching this week's video and uh, I will see you all next week. Bye.